Today on Stronger Than Reason, we go back to basics with Ministry's landmark album, The Land of Rape and Honey. Welcome to Stronger Than Reason. So, I started this show in January of 2023, and here I am, 34 episodes later, Maybe the hardest part of starting a show like this, once deciding to go through with it, is picking a title, because we kind of set the tone for everything that would follow, and I had to think, what kind of music did I really want to talk about? And contrary to what you might think by following this show, I do like a lot of different kinds of music. My collection is pretty varied. I realized the show couldn't have a bit of a range, but that I'd have to focus, but What should I focus on? I have maybe 400 CDs and maybe 100 tapes and who knows how many tracks that are just digital only. So it took some thought. And I knew I wanted to focus on the alternative music of my youth, the 80s and 90s, stuff that was truly alternative in the 80s and broke through in the 90s. You know, the kind of stuff that got no radio play except on college radio, the kind of stuff that you couldn't really hear without a friend to turn you on to it or maybe they had an older sibling who was cooler than you and your friends or because you had the one friend who had once lived in the bigger town with the better record stores or maybe you read a zine one time that talked about this band and that's how you learned about it that's why you know that's how you came across this stuff and I realized that in my world there was really one band that stood at the center of all of these things one person really who acted as a catalyst, and he almost single-handedly built this thriving alternative music scene in his then hometown of Chicago, they would go on to influence much of the music that I loved. And for me, it was a journey that started with one album. Uh, It was an early effort of his that paved a new road for my own tastes and for industrial music as a whole. Of course, that person was Al Jorgensen, and his band was Ministry. And it was his second album, Twitch, that switched me on to a whole world of music that wasn't easily available in 1987. It was music that wasn't on the radio, wasn't on MTV, and it wasn't just being shoved down your throat over the sound system at the grocery store. It was an alternative to all of that, which is what we mean by alternative music. And maybe that term means less these days now that all music is really available, the mere touch of a button. But back then... Twitch was my first step into that mysterious other world. So it made sense to talk about Twitch in my very first episode back in January. And as great as Twitch was, though, to me, looking at Ministry's career, it really wasn't their most acclaimed album. That title would go to their next album, the third one, one that I wouldn't hear for a year or more until one of my school friends decided to pick it up and make a tape for me. This was the album that would take Ministry to the next level. I think it's arguably their greatest. After all, it was the first collaboration between Al Jorgensen and his longtime associate, Paul Barker. Uh, It would stick them firmly, I would say, in the center of the whole industrial rock scene for about the next decade at least. And it would be hailed as the prototypical industrial rock album. I'd say its influence on the genre can't be overstated. It would impact everything that would follow, and its legacy would last to the present day and beyond, just triggering dozens of other projects, some of which were even by Al and Paul themselves, as I discussed in episode 23, the one about all a ministry's side projects. Al and Paul just tapped into this huge seam of creativity, more than even ministry could contain. So the late 80s and the early 90s saw them release music under a lot of different assumed names, But they all grew from this one album that they did together, the first one that Al and Paul made. And I think this album was something of a statement of intent. It was like a flag that they planted in the ground to lay claim to this new sonic territory that mashed up dance and experimental music and punk and metal and sampling. And they would spend much of the 90s just establishing a wide perimeter around that flag. And other bands saw what was going on, that they were being successful, and they kind of flocked to the same site in hopes of claim jumping or finding their own pan of gold. Uh, Twitch may have been a landmark for me, but it really wasn't the landmark ministry album. 
So while I talked about Twitch in my first episode, I ended up naming this show after three words in the first song of this iconic third album, which of course was The Land of Rape and Honey, which they released in 1988. The lead-off track of which was their signature song, Stigmata, the first verse of which starts with the words, Stronger Than Reason. So, there's so much to talk about with this album, it's hard to know where to start. So, as usual, I'm going to start with the first time I heard it. And as I said in the first episode, I got into ministry because a friend taped a copy of Twitch. And that was probably, I want to say it was around 1987 or so. Uh, I had that tape for a couple years before I ever saw an actual real ministry release in a store. So... As I may have said a few times, I grew up in a pretty small town, and my local commercial music selection was very limited, let's say. So I must have listened to Twitch for a long time without knowing anything at all about it, like track titles, who was in the band, the artwork, or anything. And I remember finally finding it on cassette in a National Record Mart, and I just snapped it right up. And I pretty much devoured the liner notes and the track list hoping to get some kind of insight into this band that I love. And I do have a distinct memory of starting to see more ministry in stores around that time, specifically seeing the Rape and Honey uh, on CD back in the days when CDs were still in long boxes. And I had really no idea what that album was. It looked different enough that I wondered if it was even the same band. And you might ask, why didn't I buy it right away? Well, simple. I didn't have a CD player. I wasn't that cool. And also, I was just a cheap bastard. So I'd bide my time until a friend picked it up along with their fourth album, which was, of course, A Mind is a Terrible Thing to Taste. He'd make me a copy of each. And I got to tell you, that tape got a lot of play with me with each album on one side. Obviously, I'd pick them both up on CD myself once I got something to play them on. So don't get all righteous on me for not supporting Al. Lord knows Al's gotten plenty of my money over the years. Uh, Now, I'm not really going to talk about the Mind album here, even though I first heard it pretty much alongside Land. Mind is going to be a separate episode entirely, and it has to be, or this is going to be like an hour and a half long, and you're not going to want to listen to that, and I'm just going to lose my voice. Uh, But I can tell you that we were absolutely floored by The Land of Rape and Honey. Uh, It was recognizable as the ministry we heard on Twitch. It was the same guy singing most of the songs, though without the goofy English accent. But it took that experimentalism and really amped up the aggression. So suddenly there were guitars, the vocals were shouted, the drums hit harder. Some of the songs were just super fast and obviously designed for a mosh pit. But it wasn't just uncut aggression. Some of the songs on here are very funky, they're groovy or experimental, but they always kind of have a hard edge of some sort. So it's produced with a lot of distortion, there's a lot of noise and grit. And remember, this was back in the ultra-clean late 80s when NXS and Robert Palmer owned the charts, and people were all about that clean production. So hearing all this filth was just jarring and exciting, especially the overdriven drums. Uh, The rest of the industry really wouldn't turn to dirt and grind until grunge appeared in the early 90s. And when that happened, Ministry found that they were perfectly poised for the enrockification, which we've been talking about over the last few uh, shows. They'd switch from this sort of electro-industrial grind or whatever the heck was on this record here and kind of turn towards straight-up metal, which... Honestly, some of us took a dim view on, but that was later. Uh, Back in 1988, Al and Paul were still well ahead of the curve. So I like this album and that it it drove me farther down the road that Twitch started me on. But this was much heavier. And, you know, among my friends, we debated what to call this music. It was industrial, sure, but it also had some thrash elements, at least on a couple songs. There was stuff on here that even metalheads could enjoy. It was just really heavy. Um, But this album wasn't really metal. It was still largely electronic. A lot of it was obviously programmed, like the drums. So it didn't seem like there was a real drummer here pounding away 30-second notes on the kick drum, you know, here on a typical speed metal record. But, you know, they would kind of turn towards that again in later albums. But thinking about it, I really decided that what made this album sound so different was the emphasis on the drums. 
So no matter the flavor of the song here, Al boosted the drums to the foreground. They are just huge. They had that big gated reverb with a distortion, but still packed enough punch to just pin you to the floor. And listening to it, you kind of heard the drums first and then whatever else was going on later. And that was really just the opposite to most of the popular music of the day, which really emphasized the vocals or occasionally the guitar. Very few bands at this time in the late 80s were just sticking drums in your face and making the rhythm the main thing. I mean, Al, the way he did the production on this record, he made every snare drum hit sound like a shot from a high-powered rifle, and every kick sounded like the footsteps of God herself. So that twist that he made and the usual production methods really gave this album a real visceral punch. I mean, you could feel the beat in your guts. There's a lot of power here, you know, and that power really spoke to something that was deep inside your reptile brain. And this album provoked a reaction, even if that reaction was that everyone else in your car demanded that you turn it off right away, which definitely happened a few times. Uh, Some people just couldn't take it. But for others, it would feed this kind of energy. I can still get pumped up listening to this album. It's great for a workout. It's great for a long drive. If you have to stay awake, you'll just be driving down the highway, tooting your horn to the drums and stigmata or whatever. But... This album really opened my eyes to how electronic music could be aggressive. It's not just wimpy synth pads or arpeggiators blooping away or corny square wave leads in the chorus or poppy dance mixes. So this album had all the menace of heavy metal, but maybe was even a little more dangerous in a way because at least with metal, you could put a label on it, right? You could put it in a box and you knew what it was. You knew what to call it. If you bought a Metallica album, you knew exactly what you were getting. The thing that Ministry was doing here had no good label. Uh, Remember, at the time, the term industrial was better applied to earlier bands like Throbbing Gristle and Test Department and SPK. Ministry was borrowing some of the aspects of that early industrial, but they were marrying it up with techno and punk and thrash and putting it all in this big pot and just making gumbo. And Ministry themselves, the guys putting this together, were also an unknown quantity. No one really knew who they were. And it really was all guys for the most part, except for Al's then-wife, Patty, who was their tour manager. But who were these people? Like, no one knew. Were they cool or not? Were they just psychopaths? Were they a bunch of guys just taking the piss? Were they devil worshippers or snake handlers? Were they into voodoo, Scientology, Jehovah's Witnesses? I mean, we heard a lot of crazy rumors, but remember back then, all we really had was Thrasher Magazine and MTV to give us any insight, and reports on the ground were pretty hard to find at first. We wouldn't really get into the internet for a few years, and even then, it was just a way to kind of spread rumors more quickly. So it took years for us to sort all this out. But ministry started getting some play in my school. The metalheads, I think, were put off by it a bit. They realized it wasn't really metal, so right away something smelled funny to them. But the energy was right, and in the end, I remember they agreed that Ministry was pretty cool. And by the time Ministry played Lollapalooza in 1992, most of the metalheads were fans. Hell, by then, everyone was a fan. But another thing that uh, happened around this time of first hearing the land of rape and honey was our growing awareness of ministry's various relationships to a lot of the other bands that we liked. So they were like a big old octopus with these tentacles, just getting into everything. So first there were all the various ministry side projects to consider. And I went into those in the previous episode. So check that out for more info. Uh, you know, Alan Paul had a lot of projects with a variety of other cool personalities like Ian Mackay and Jello Biafra And then there was the Revolting Cox, which wasn't so much a side project as it was a sister band. Maybe the good cop to Ministry's bad cop. I talked about that in the episode about beer steers and queers. We knew that Ministry was tightly associated with Chicago's Wax Tracks record label, which was the preeminent industrial label at the time. It was kind of the center of the whole scene. And we didn't know all the details. But we knew that a lot of the ministry-related bands were also on wax tracks, and all the bands tended to tour together and kind of trade guitarists and stuff. So 
And of course, we also learned that Al had produced Skinny Puppy's album Rabies uh, in 1989. So we knew there was a bond of some kind between those two bands. Soon enough, we'd see Al produce a B-side for Nine Inch Nails. So, you know, right away, our three favorite industrial bands were all collaborating. Ministry, Skinny Puppy, and Nine Inch Nails. So it was pretty clear that Al himself was the link between all of these things. Again, as I said, he was a catalyst. He was someone who made things happen. So let's talk about The Land of Rape and Honey. Let's talk about the album. And, you know, we'll start here with the artwork. So, yeah, the artwork. Um, So for the longest time, I figured it was an abstract of some sort. And to me, it looks like a Polaroid someone took of a TV screen up close. You know, I used to take a lot of weird pictures with my camera back in the day when I had an old-timey CRT television. You could get right up close to it and just snap a bunch a bunch of pictures, and it looked really cool. It was kind of an obvious thing to do. But no one really knew for sure what this was on the cover until Al spilled the beans in an interview. And it's actually a shot of human remains in a Nazi concentration camp. So we, we have to ask here, what was the point? And I'm not sure there is a point other than it was just Al being provocative. I think he just wanted to use the shot without any further message. It's something that he snapped at his home one night. Um, and, you know, now wait a minute, I can hear you saying he decided to call this album The Land of Rape and Honey. So what's the message there? Well, it turns out that was actually a joke. Yes, a joke. And it's a play on words, much like most ministry album titles would be after this one. So, for instance, The Mind is a Terrible Thing to Taste, The Dark Side of the Spoon, Houses of the Mole, From Beer to Eternity, and so on. So, in this case, The Land of Rape and Honey was actually a saying on a souvenir mug that Al saw because it happened to be the motto of the town of Tisdale, Saskatchewan, up up there in Canada, eh? And you might ask, (laughs) what exactly is going on in Tisdale that that would be their motto? Well, good thing you ask. They produce honey, and you guessed it, they produce rapeseed. Now, rapeseed is an unfortunately named grain, and after five seconds of diligent Googling, I've learned that it's the third largest source of vegetable oil, specifically canola oil, and the second largest source of protein meal in the world. So... Maybe we can forgive Tisdale for their weird motto, given that context. But, you know, if you juxtapose that saying with a screenshot of Buchenwald, it kind of takes on a different meaning. So, apparently, Sire, Al's label, they balked at this picture. I can't imagine why. So, Al claimed he found a roadkill deer cut off its head and drove it all the way to Sire in L.A., threw it on a table and told the art department, here's your new album cover. And that story is in his biography, which I bought in hardcover and talked about in the Revco Beer Steers and Queers episode. Editor's note, that was episode 18. But that story is also on Wikipedia, of course, because Wikipedia, as we all know, is the next best thing to actually learning something. But supposedly that happened, according to Al, anyway. Makes a good story. And Sire preferred the original photo, So that's what we've got here, and that pretty much explains the art and the title. Now, I can hear someone else out there saying, but wait, Al sampled Nazi salutes in the title track. Doesn't that make him a Nazi? And to that, I say, no, it does not. Anyone who's followed Al's career at all knows that he's a raging leftist. Why nothing gets Al more riled up than a Republican in the White House. To wit, he produced Twitch and Land of Rape and Honey during the Reagan years, then Mine during the reign of Bush Sr., had a bunch of crappy albums during the Clinton administration, but then he struck back with a trilogy of metal albums during the Bush Jr. years. So anyone who knows Al even a little bit knows that this is true. So yeah, politically, he's as far from fascism as it's possible to get. In fact, Al's practically a communist the way he reinvested all his cash back into his various musical projects. Oh, and also drugs. Regardless, he's not really the guy who made a vast fortune and hoarded it for himself. And also, he's best friends with Jello Biafra, the guy who recorded a song called Nazi Punks F Off. What does that tell you? Right, he's not a Nazi. So why did he sample that? I don't have an answer other than it's Al just making fun of them or being ironic or 
just maybe being contrary. You got to remember the 70s and 80s, post-punk and alternative uh, was just a bit more provocative than we're used to now in these more enlightened times. And Al might have just been trying to see what he could get away with. Anyway, if you had asked me in 1989 to describe this album cover, I would have said purple. Needless to say, the internet and Wikipedia and all that have just filled in all the gaps. Back then, it was just mysterious. It just looked cool. And you have to like the font, too. Uh, It's definitely handwritten, not computerized, because the letters are all slightly different. And I want to say it's the work of the Wax Tracks house designer, Brian Shanley, but I don't really know for sure. He must have done something with the cover, though, since he was credited in here. Uh, But you can open this thing up. And it folds out, the insert folds out in this like really annoying way to show the track list and the credits. Uh, yeah, it's all handwritten. This is not unlike the liner notes for Tones on Tales Night Music that I, I talked about before. It had a very similar cool handwritten font. I think that was episode five, kids. But yeah, you can see some band credits here. Um, who was ministry at the time? Well, we see it was... Al Jorgensen and Paul Barker listed as the band, which was a change since Twitch was just Al. But down here with the additional musicians, uh, we have Bill Riflin and Chris Connolly, both of whom were in Revolting Cox by this time, along with Al, Paul, and Luke Van Acker. So the gang was finally all here. And uh, notice that this is the first production by Hypo Luxa and Hermes Pan, a.k.a. Al and Paul, Uh, Except for the last track, Abortive, which, uh, you know, was produced by someone that they call Eddie Echo. And, you know, word on the street was that that was actually Al's former producer, Adrian Sherwood. Uh, Al supposedly traded him a gram of speed for this track and then just slapped it on the end of this album. So that's pretty funny and maybe is a nice little salute to Adrian, who would inadvertently teach Al everything he knew on Twitch only for Al to jettison him and take control himself. And we know that Paul, uh, that Paul was no slouch as a producer, since at this time he was producing the Finney Tribe, which is more or less how they brought in Chris Connolly. Um, probably not for the last time I advise anyone listening to check out Chris's memoir, Concrete Bulletproof, Invisible and Fried, My Life as a Revolting Cock. It tells this entire story from his perspective and is actually uh, very hilarious to boot. Um... The only other thing I want to say about the track list here is that this CD version contains two extra songs. So there's Hezbollah and I Prefer, uh, both of which are really cool. This was typical at the time, you know, where all the cool vinyl collectors would miss out on little tidbits like this, not to mention all of us very uncool cassette collectors who didn't have CD players. So there was actually a decent incentive to pony up for the CD. It was a longer format, but, you know, they took advantage of that, and you got some more material. So to me, this album just doesn't flow the same without those two songs, because I've been listening to the CD version ever since this came out. Um, In particular, you have to have I Prefer, because it's Paul Barker's vocal debut, and, you know, why would you not want that? So yeah, in my book, The Land of Rape and Honey properly has 11 tracks, not nine. So what about the music? So... In terms of composition, Al famously said that he embraced the William Burroughs cut-up method. Uh, He described just cutting up all the audio tape and just doing a casino wash on the studio floor and then putting them all back together again in a way that just pleased him. And personally, I don't buy it. These songs all have a fairly regular pop structure. It's not just random noise. It's not very jarring. It all kind of flows smoothly. So unless he did this to assemble individual instruments or parts, maybe as a way to compose lyrics or leads, I don't know. I'm just not hearing it. The album is noisy, but it's not random noise. These are definitely pop songs, and in general, they have at least a verse-chorus structure. And some are more experimental than others, but I have a hard time buying that this was a real cut-up. Al never gave a specific example here, so... Who knows? It's hard for me to say. Maybe this is something that he did early on to kind of get the ball rolling, to do some initial arrangements. Maybe then he refined the songs into more of a pop structure. Uh, It's hard to say. I don't know. Let me know what you think about that. But yeah, let's do the track by track. And you see, I have a lifetime music guarantee from We Three Records. 
valid at the wall. So I may have to call that in because it's getting a little scuffed up here. I don't know. So yeah, we'll do the track by track here. Things start off nice and easy with Stigmata. Of course, this is Ministry's signature song. And if you know one Ministry song, it's probably this one. And from what Al says, he threw it together at the last minute because he realized this album was too short. And he's just such a contrarian. You know, not only is he sampling the Nazis, he's also quick to say that he hates this beloved song. Just because everyone else loves it, probably. You know, that would be classic Al. But it's got this punky vibe and evidently no real guitars. He says he crafted the main classic riff using the pitch bend wheel and his sampler. But live, this song definitely becomes a guitar monstrosity. And I'm just going to mention now the existence, the mere existence of their live album and video in case you didn't feel like showing up. But it's a given already that any ministry fan listening to me talk right now um, has already seen this a million times. Uh, Every live version on that record is amped way up from the studio version, including Stigmata. I have very fuzzy, warm memories of the gang watching it over and over in my basement rec room back in the day. We had every moment memorized. And we actually taped our audio cassettes from the video because for whatever reason the video had a couple extra songs it started with this iconic version of breathe and ended with jello biafra's flag pledge and the track the land of rape and honey all of which were just completely badass and al should really be ashamed that he didn't include them on the record he just wanted us to buy both i guess which we did uh but by the way i don't think they ever released that video on dvd i think it was only ever out on vhs but of course it is on youtube Uh, This was a video they did from the Mind is a Terrible Thing to Taste tour, the first one where they put up the big chain link fence across the stage. It's just, you know, iconic. I say that a lot because a lot of these things are iconic. It's just truly great stuff. It's ministry at their live peak, maybe if not their recorded peak. So yeah, mandatory watching. Um, More on that video when I tackle the Mind album later. But back to Stigmata. This was the only song here to get the full single treatment. The single only came out on vinyl with an extended remix on side A and this new song on side B called Tonight We Murder featuring vocals from Groovy Man of My Life with the Thrill Kill Cult. And that might seem odd until you realize that Al and Groovy were friends from way back. They were in a band called Special Effect before starting Ministry and TKK respectively. And Groovy, of course, was well within the Wax Tracks camp. And Tonight We Murder may have had its origins in special effect. I'm not sure, but I am sure that TKK would reuse the lyrics on their own track, Burning Dirt, on their classic album, Confessions of a Knife, which I dug into back in Lucky Episode 13. So the Stigmata single is pretty cool. It's kind of a ministry TKK crossover of sorts. And there was also a video for Stigmata on MTV. It's got a lot of jump cuts of eyeballs and... Al rolling around on the ground and Paul riding his motorcycle and lots of shots of heavy equipment, which only makes sense for an industrial track. So it's pretty typical industrial video from the late 80s. And, you know, I want to say this song was also featured in an episode of Beverly Hills 90210, but I, I forgot to double check that, but I have this strange memory that that was the case, which is pretty funny. But the song itself is really catchy. It might be the rockiest song on the album and that it's sort of a mid-tempo tune and has that awesome sampled riff in it. But the next two tracks are more unusual, and I lump them together because they're very similar. Uh, They were also often played live in this order. They were The Missing and Deity. Both are these fast guitar songs with these jackhammer drums, and I love them both just for their sheer energy. I admire Al's ability to count bars and time his vocals just right with all the stuff that's going on in these songs so quickly. Uh, the Missing's probably my favorite of the two. I can hear Chris Connolly in the chorus. And what I really like about it is how the ver- in the verse, the bass line repeats this downward pattern while the guitar is riffing this upward pattern. But somehow when you put them together, it like works really well. And it all goes in this tight, fast lockstep. Uh, The other funny thing about The Missing is that it's just so short, it's not even three minutes long. It's like spending three minutes in a blender. Uh, Deity is very similar. It's got a slightly more complex arrangement. The guitar riff is very simple. It's just three notes. Anyone could play it. 
Um, there's also a kind of guitar solo too, or maybe it's a synth solo. It's kind of hard to tell. But I think the best part of this tune is the bit in the middle where everything suddenly stops for a second and then it comes crashing back in. Uh, but essentially these songs together act as a filter. If you think about it, it's really a filter uh, to weed out anyone who really should not be listening to this record because if they don't like these two tunes, they're just going to get repelled right away. And uh, that, I think that's the purpose. That's why they're so far up in the, the track list. Uh, these songs are short. They might be short, but this is six and a half minutes of complete ear punishment. And if you don't love it, you should probably stop here. Uh, however, the very next song mellows things out and slows things down. At least it does after 10 seconds of screeching guitar feedback. Uh, and it's probably my favorite song on the whole album. It's called Golden Dawn. And it features one of Paul's funkiest bass lines. And the drums are just swinging, just super heavy with some amazing fills. Al plays this great guitar solo through the entire thing. Now, it's an instrumental, but it has a lot of vocal samples from horror movies and whatnot. Of course, this was the 80s. But the bit that everyone remembers is where it just repeats the Antichrist over and over. I mean, what's not to like about that? I mean, who doesn't want to hear that blasting out of your car windows on a hot summer day? Everyone wants to hear it. That's who. So give them what they want. Uh, weirdly, this tune ends with the sounds of croaking frogs for some reason. I don't know. Someone call Stephen Morris. But that goes into maybe the strangest song here, Destruction, which is this other noisy instrumental with a lot of peculiar echoed vocal samples. I'm sure it was just Al in a room yelling, Destruction, over and over, and just clanging a lot of metal. At one point, it has an actual beat and bass line. But really, it's just super noisy, lots of feedback, lots of echoes and everything. This one doesn't do as much for me, relatively speaking. It's still better than 90% of the songs out there. But the ending is totally awesome because it's a bunch of trippy sound effects. And at the very end, it sounds like a spaceship is just taking off, like E.T. is phoning home. That must have been Al's mushrooms kicking in. But then we have one of the CD-only tracks, Hezbollah, and... Uh, you know, that's a reference to obviously to the Lebanese political group. And this is just a really neat little instrumental. It's got a lot of interesting percussion and backward sampling. All the vocals are sampled. There's a female voice singing it in another language. And the whole thing has a, a, something of like a Middle Eastern feel, but it's very ominous. It's got this uh, arpeggiated bass line that makes it sound very front two for two ish. It's just a cool song. I think it was definitely worth getting the CD to have that tune. Uh, next up is the title track, The Land of Rape and Honey, which is actually a poppy a crowd pleaser. It's got a really standard backbeat, and it has these really cool synth hooks throughout the whole thing. And, you know, this is the one with the Nazi samples, though. As kids, we didn't realize that, or at least I didn't. Maybe my smarter friends realized it. They're listening to this show, so guys, tell me, did you know this song had Nazi samples on it? Maybe I'm just an idiot. Uh... <laughs> All I knew was that this song really rocked. I love the drum samples. Uh, it just seemed really accessible. Al is singing on this one, but it was really, really hard as a kid to make out what the hell he was saying. And of course, there's no lyric sheet in the liner notes. So whatever the message he had here was for us, I wasn't getting it. It wasn't coming through. And later, of course, I could look up his lyrics and I could watch the performance of this song on the live video and I could kind of put two and two together and realize that this was Al's indictment of jingoism and fascism, which is something I can totally get behind. But yeah, this should have been the second signal, a single. It's just a really catchy, cool song. Has some key changes, you know, a cool instrumental breakdown. Just kind of a fun song. And then we have another favorite, You Know What You Are. And the first five seconds of this tune might be the best five seconds on the entire album, or the best five seconds of any ministry album. It starts with a sample of an evil laugh from a fistful of dollars and then just bashes you over the head with the heaviest synth groove you've ever heard. There's no guitars here at all, but it's still incredibly heavy and relentless. It's all driven by this 4-4 kick drum with very little snare. Al sings vocals here, but they're so affected out that I can't make any sense of them. This is just a classic ministry song. Awesome beat, super heavy, great samples. It just rocks, and there's not much more I can say about it. 
Then the other CD only track I prefer. You know this is special when it starts with the sound of a drill. Uh, yes, this is industrial rock at its finest. And again, Mr. Paul Barker on vocals. It's just a catchy little song. It's the shortest one on the album at just over two minutes, but very cool nonetheless. Again, worth getting the CD just for that track. Uh, next up is Flashback, which we all loved as kids because of the whimsical and imaginative lyrics, most of which Al adapted from Full Metal Jacket. And we didn't know that, of course. It'd be a few years before we saw that movie, and then we were like, oh yeah, he's saying the lyrics from Flashback. Uh, Music-wise, this tune is pretty much all rhythm. It's got a lot of samples and drums, and Al more or less just chants over that. He does throw in a little guitar solo of sorts, and they did a video for this, though I, I don't recall seeing it back in the day, probably because MTV wouldn't have touched this song with a 100-foot pole with all the profanity in it. Um, but if that's news to you like it was to me that they did a real video for this, check it out. It's a fun video. It's pretty much what you'd expect. It's just Al and Paul, again, like Stigmata, a lot of fast cuts, some neat slow shutter effects, and just more shots of bulldozers. Uh, the song itself I find kind of meh. I don't think it's the best work on this album. I kind of lump it in the same bucket as Test from the Mind album, but more on that later. Uh, finally, we have Abortive. This sounds much more like something from Twitch, maybe because it's an Adrian Sherwood song. As I said before, there's nothing too original here. This is pretty much industrial by the numbers. It has Adrian's trademark big drums and some synth arpeggio, lots of NASA samples. Meh. It kind of makes you wonder why I'll put it on the album at all. So yeah, that's the album. Not counting abortive. This is... uh ministry's most acclaimed album it's not just me who thinks that uh al is on the record as saying it's his favorite ministry album too and the gang recently did a series of interviews about it for the 30th anniversary al chris and paul all are on youtube talking about this album their thoughts on it you could check those out online they all had great things to say uh but what was it about this record that was so innovative why is it always held up as this watershed moment for industrial rock? Um, I guess because it was maybe the first album to marry up the sounds of electronic industrial music with the energy of punk and metal. So it kind of mashed up all these different styles in a really successful way. And I can't think of how to explain this better than to just ask you to listen to Abortive, which was kind of the old sound, and then Stigmata or The Land of Rape and Honey, which is where Al kind of took that sound to the next level. Um, essentially, when you get right down to it, Al and Paul were the first ones to enrockify industrial music. They thought, what if we took all the abrasiveness and experimentalism of industrial but added this pop structure and all these familiar drum, guitar, and bass sounds? And no one else had really done that. Now, of course, it seems like the obvious thing to do all these years later. It usually does in retrospect. And this is the sound, though, that Nine Inch Nails would emulate when Trent started recording Pretty Hate Machine shortly after this came out. And it's the sound that Skinny Puppy clearly wanted when they partnered with Al to produce Rabies. And it's the sound that KMFDM would lean into when they would open for ministry in 1990. And later, of course, we'd call it Industrial Rock, and it would be good. Uh, but this album is an undeniably one that launched a thousand ships. It was a taste of the next few years. So why do I love it? Obviously, it's an important album. I love it because of its sheer energy. Again, this is music to get pumped up to. And I've said it before in the Revco episode, but they just don't really make music that sounds quite like this anymore. Because grunge came along and just blew this sound right off the map before I feel like it could really be fully explored. I think there's still a lot of potential in this sound, uh, just aggressive electronic music. And I also love the way that Al and Paul presented it. So they went on tour for this album. It was very interesting. You can see the shows on YouTube. It was Al on guitar and singing. Paul was on bass. Jeff Ward was on drums. And Bill Reiflin was on keys. And the cool part really was the stage setup. This was the tour before the chain link fence, but they had like sandbags and razor wire on stage. Like the stage was a military fortification. Uh, this was like Al going to war with the audience, I guess. And it was something different. And I'm sure 
it could it, it, it must have knocked people off kilter no one knew what was going on or what to expect or what to call this and al was just exploiting the chaos as he did he was steering things into this weird crazy mad max kind of scene um, I also love that Ogre joined them for a few dates in this tour and took over singing duties. So you can find clips here and there of Ogre fronting ministry for their entire Rape and Honey set, singing all the tunes. And what's really cool is that they even played some songs from Twitch in this tour, like We Believe. You know, Stuff Ministry would really never play live again. And they threw in No Devotion from Revco. I think it's really cool to hear Ogre singing all that stuff. Uh, But yeah, that entire set used to be on YouTube, but I haven't been able to find it lately, which is kind of a shame. I did see a a couple clips of him singing No Devotion and The Light Pours Out of Me, which was a magazine cover. It was really something else. But yeah, Land was so far ahead of the game that Ministry could effectively coast on it for a couple of albums while the rest of the industry tried to catch up. And it wouldn't really be a a a few albums later until Filth Pig that they would veer again into a completely different direction. And at that point, they'd kind of lose me because I wasn't really interested in sludge rock. But that's okay. As far as I was concerned, the fact that they released these three amazing studio albums, Twitch, The Land of Rape and Honey, and The Mind is a Terrible Thing to Taste, made them forever favorites in my book. They could release nothing but crap after that, and I would still be happy. Some people argue that that's exactly the case. I still like some of their things, but... I definitely think these three albums are their best. Not to mention all the awesome side projects and related bands. So that's really it, kids. Ministry's high water mark, The Land of Rape and Honey. It's their most critically acclaimed and influential album. It's kind of like they took an album from the overdriven 90s and just dropped it back into 1988. It blew some minds for sure. It definitely blew mine. You're listening to Stronger Than Reason. And not a show with some other different name, only because of this ministry record that meant so much to me. So this show is on YouTube, of course, but it's also available as an Apple and Spotify podcast if you like to listen on on the go. I'm kind of having second thoughts of supporting Spotify. Uh, maybe that could be its own episode, me complaining about Spotify. Do you like Spotify? If so, you know, let me know. Let me know if you hate it. Uh, if you'd like to hear more reviews of old ass albums, please like and subscribe. It only encourages me. Uh, If you made it this far, thank you for listening. You're one of the good ones. Until next time, stay strong.